All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Justin Esri from Rice University. Uh, welcome to the International Methods Colloquium. The International Methods Colloquium is a periodic online interactive seminar discussion on the application of quantitative statistical methodology to the social sciences, sponsored by Rice University and the National Science Foundation. This week's speaker is Olga Chiza of the Iowa State University Departments of Political Science and Statistics. Her talk is entitled, A Local Structure uh, Graph Model, Formation of Network Edges as a Function of Other Edges, and this is co-authored work with Mark Kaiser. Olga's talk is going to last between 30 to 40 minutes, at, uh, after which point we'll take questions from the audience. You can ask a question using the Zoom Q&A button that appears at the bottom of your, we of your webinar window. And I'll just uh, point out, you can ask a question anytime, you can type it in and it'll show up, but unless it's a really brief clarifying question, we'll hold it to the end of the talk. Uh, a link to Olga's paper and slideshow will be available in the Zoom webinar chat window so that you may refer to it throughout the presentation. And uh, I have those links, I'll post them in the chat window right after I'm done with this introduction. And now I'd like to welcome Olga Chizza to the International Methods Colloquium. Olga, welcome. Hi, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So this is work in collaboration with Mark Kaiser. And um, this project has two main objectives. The first objective is to expand network theory to help analyze and model a completely new class of problems, a class of problems that we don't usually think of when we hear words like network analysis and network theory. These problems involve processes such as coalition building, diffusion, tipping point processes, and other processes in which network connections or network edges form as a function of formation specific other edges within the network. So in order to model these processes, as I will explain, we need to move beyond thinking of networks in terms of a network that connects nodes with edges to networks in which edges themselves can be thought of as nodes and connections among them can be thought of as edges among edges. And then in the second part of this presentation, I'm going to talk about how to model these processes in a statistical way with what we call a local structure graph model. I'm going to show some Monte Carlo results, and then I'm going to also show how this applies to two applications within the study of political science, uh, application to international alliance formation and an application to legislative cooperation in US Senate. So here's what we think of when we hear the word network. Here's a generic network among five nodes numbered one through five, and each pair of nodes is either connected or not connected by an edge. So for example, you can see here that nodes, node one is connected to node three, uh, but node one is not connected to node two. Okay, and now you see the exact same network on the left, but the network on the right is actually a re reconceptualization of the exact same network, but now each edge in the network on the left became a node in the network on the right. So you can see that, for example, the edge between nodes one and three became a node, became node one, three, and an edge between nodes one and five became node one, five. And so in this new reconceptualization of the same network, we see that each pair of edges is now either connected or not connected by an edge. So, a no, so edge one three is connected to edge one five, but edge one three is, for example, not connected to edge down here uh, two five. And so, in this uh, um, in this example, I defined connectivity among edges as sharing a common node. So edge one three is connected to edge one five because they share node five or not node one in common. Of course, we can conceptualize connectivities among edges in other ways. You can conceptualize connectivities among edges, for example, as sharing as uh, connecting two types of the same node. So two edges can be connected if both of them are edges between two types of the same node. So two black nodes or two blue nodes uh, or uh, two nodes that are odd numbered. If you if you want to think of this in terms of applications to political science and you want to think of uh, nodes as countries and uh, edges as alliance relationships between them, then you can think of two alliances as being connected 
if they both connect to democracies or if they both connect states with roughly equal capabilities. Uh, you can also think of uh, connections among edges, not in terms of binary terms, but also in terms of continuous terms. So in this next figure, I have a reconceptualization of the uh, network among my five nodes, where each node here represents an edge. So you still see edge 1-3 and edge 1-5. But now my edges are arranged in Cartesian space, where identifiers associated with each node that makes up an edge um, are used as uh, coordinates. So the uh, smaller identifier is used as the X coordinate and the larger identifier is used as the Y coordinate, which allows me to place my edges in the Cartesian space. So now you see that some edges are closer to each other than other edges. For example, edge one, three and two, three are closer in the space uh, to each other than edge one, three, two, for example, edge four, five. All right. So this, now I'm going to walk you through how the same framework would apply to a political science application, specifically formation of international alliances. Here we see the international alliance network as it existed in 1955. Nodes here are countries. So, and the edges between them represent alliance, formation of an alliance between two countries in that year. So we see that there, in 1955, there were two large blocks that formed. One block between Soviet Union, Hungary, Romania, Czechoslovakia, and Poland, and the other block between United Kingdom, Turkey, Pakistan, Iran, and Iraq. Now I'm going to take this network and reconceptualize it in terms of a network in which each alliance, each binary alliance is going to be a node, and we're going to focus on relationships among these alliances. But before I do that, I want to talk about the theoretical logic behind why um, it's even necessary to reconceptualize a network in which countries are nodes and alliances between them are edges into a network where alliances themselves become nodes and the relationships among them are modeled. So this existing framework where countries are nodes and alliances are edges is um, very useful for modeling a large number of processes that we may think leads to uh, formation of international alliances. But this framework necessarily limits us to modeling either node level covariates or edge level covariates. So uh, using this framework, for example, we can uh, study processes that posit that an alliance is more likely to form if, um, as a result of some characteristics of states that make it up. So two democracies are more likely to form alliances or two states with equally, uh, with the roughly equal capabilities are more likely to form alliances. But a lot of alliance process, a lot of alliance theories posit processes that go beyond node level and edge level covariates. For example, we have theories that say that alliances may form in response to some other alliances that are forming in the network. So Soviet Union may want to form some alliances in response to some alliances that are being formed within the US sphere of influence. And these processes require going beyond the network in which countries are nodes and alliances are edges to treating alliance as a unit of analysis itself and then modeling its relationship to all other potential alliances or specific potential alliances in order to understand uh, how an alliance may form as a function of other alliances that uh, form in a network. And the exact same the theoretical process uh, allows us to also model other interesting processes within political science, such as formation of legislative coalitions or advocacy groups, or we can think about parties joining, um, joining together to share ballot lines uh, or advocacy groups and a lot of other processes. Okay, so in order to uh, reconceptualize a network of alliances in terms of a network of edges among edges, I'm going to use ideal point scores that are based on United Nations General Assembly voting developed by uh, Bailey Stresnyf and Voten. Ideal point scores exist for all states between 1946 and 2007. Ideal point scores uh, follow a standard normal distribution um, and range between negative three and positive three. 
U.S. scores tend to be positive and large, whereas Soviet Union or Russia usually has negative uh, scores um, on this metric. So in order to place alliances in a Cartesian space, I'm going to use each alliance partner's score as X and Y coordinates. And then Euclidean distance between alliances is going to be a measure of ideational distance. Okay, so we take this alliance network and we can transform it into this uh, network or this visualization where each alliance becomes a point uh, in this Cartesian space and the location of a point is determined by the ideal points of the two alliance partners. So on the x-axis, I have the ideal score of the alliance partner with minimum score in the alliance, in the bilateral alliance. And then on the y-axis, I have the ideal point of the partner with the maximum ideal score. So I'm going to highlight just a couple of uh, insights that are revealed by cheating an alliance network in terms of uh, the network on the right versus the network on the left. So the network on the left, uh, all it does is it places these um, alliance blocks in a way that the software finds the most visually pleasing. Whereas in the network on the right, of course, uh, my points are placed in Cartesian space, so distance becomes meaningful. So you immediately can see several insights. You see that the alliance block between, so this is this big alliance block between Soviet Union, Poland, Hungary, Romania, and Czech Republic is much more ideationally cohesive. So in the network on the right, this alliance block is represented by a series of dots that are right on top of one another. So it's a much more ideationally cohesive block than the opposing block that is much more spread out. This of course is missed in the visualization of alliance network on the left. Another insight that becomes apparent is that alliance blocks in the, in the visualization on the right are located roughly in opposite parts of the ideational space. So that is consistent with the idea of polarization. Whereas in, of course, in the network on uh, the left, this is not apparent at all. Another insight is that alliances seem to be forming uh, between ideationally similar states. So uh, we see that alliances here form along the diagonal uh, versus if alliances tended to form among states with different policy views, then we would observe many more alliances in this corner. Okay, so now that I've introduced a way to think about this, I'm going to talk about how to model these types of processes with a focus on edges and connections among them rather than just nodes statistically. And to do this, I'm going to apply a local structure graph model. A local structure graph model is a type of a Markov random fields model, and it builds heavily on BSEC's research in the 70s but was first applied to network analysis in, by Castleton, Nordman, and Kaiser. In this statistical estimation, I'm going to treat edges as observations, and I'm going to model local dependence in edge formation by specifying a source of connectivity among edges. More formally, suppose that I is a potential edge in a network of potential edges realized or unrealized, then, S sub y, uh, sub, sorry, S sub i is, um, can be thought of i's location in Cartesian space. Now, for simple networks, the goal of statistical modeling is usually to explain why a network connection is either formed or is not formed, why an edge is realized or not realized. So, uh, the most naturally fitting type of the dependent variable here is binary. Um, so we're going to use a binary dependent variable in this uh, exposition, but this model very easily extends to other types of dependent variables, such as counts. So the dependent variable here, y sub i, is, uh, takes on the value of 1 if an edge is realized and takes on the value of 0 if the edge is not realized. The next step is to define the neighbors of each edge. We denote the neighbors of each edge as n sub i. Um, 
I cannot be its own neighbor. And neighborhoods can be thought of either in binary terms. So two edges are either neighbors or they're not. Or, uh, and this is the contribution of this specific project, uh, neighborhoods can be thought of in continuous terms. So everybody is a neighbor of everybody else, but some edges are closer neighbors than other edges. The next step, if you're dealing with binary neighborhood, is to make a Markov assumption of conditional spatial independence. Of course, if you're dealing with continuous neighborhoods, then the Markov assumption is redundant. Here's the binary conditional distribution that um, I'm going to use. So in this um, distribution, a sub i is a natural parameter function that will be de uh, defined in the follow in the uh, slide that's going to be the next slide. And uh, b sub i is a function of s sub i, is a function of a sub i. Um, and y of n sub i denote outcomes in uh, neighbors of i. Okay, here's a Here's uh, how I define the natural parameter function. So the natural parameter function a sub i consists of two parts, of two terms, the global term and the local term. The global term is essentially the logged odds. So log of kappa i over one mi minus kappa i is just x beta, where x is a vector of exogenous covariates and Beta is a vector of estimation parameters. So the term of interest here is the local dependence term. Um, so this term. Here, eta is the parameter that is going to be estimated for spatial dependence. J's, uh, J are all neighbors of I. W i j is a cell in the W matrix um, that corresponds to the to the degree of connectivity between i and j. y sub j is the outcome in um, in neighbor j, and kappa sub j is the probability of observing this outcome in j. So this term um, here is referred to within this area of the statistics literature as global parameter centering, centering by the global parameter. Um, centering by the global parameter has been shown in previous research to enhance the interpretability and to allow to separate effects into global effects and local effects. So when the, when the dependence parameter eta is equal to zero, then this model essentially is the logistic regression that we all know. When, however, uh, y sub j is greater than kappa sub j, then the dependence term makes a positive contribution to the natural parameter function. So the estimation parameter is going to be positive. And this is cons consistent with complementary processes. So uh, edge realization in i's neighbor increases the probability of edge real realization in i. When y sub j is less than kappa sub j, then the dependence parameter makes a negative contribution to the natural parameter function. This would be consistent with substitution type processes. So an outcome in i's neighbor decreases the probability of observing an outcome in i. Um, as, with the, as with all models within this class of Markov random fields models, specification of any sets of joint uh, of uh, conditionals does not lead to a valid joint, this is joint necessarily. Certain conditions must be met. And here uh, it has been shown that the necessary and sufficient condition is a symmetry of the W matrix. So if I is a member of J, is a neighbor of J, then J has to be a neighbor of I. Uh, so in contrast to spatial autoregression that has been uh, used more, fre more frequently, more recently within political science, uh, this model does not uh, require, and in fact, most of the time prohibits row, row standardization by, uh, of W. Instead, W is usually rescaled to enhance convergence of the model. So it's usually rescaled by a constant. Um, this model is usually estimated using a pseudo likelihood. Um, previous research has shown that pseudo likelihoods, pseudo likelihood allows for 
uh, recovering consistent parameter estimates. Since we are extending uh, Castleton et al.'s model to modeling neighborhoods in, continuous, uh, in the continuous terms, we start with a series of Monte Carlo simulations to demonstrate that the model still is able to recover consistent parameters. To do so, we generate a list of 100 units with characteristics captured by a exogenous variable X that's drawn from a standard normal distribution. Then we convert um, these, uh, this into dyadic data to obtain 4,950 observations. The next step is to generate a meaningful dependence matrix W. In order to do so, we placed each unit on an evenly spaced 10 by 10 grid and calculated the Euclidean distance between the two units in each dyad. Next uh, is uh, the next step is to generate the random variable. In order to generate the random variable Y, we use the Gibbs sampler, which as is conventional with these types of models. Uh, we start with the randomly initialized uh, uh, vector Y sub, sub Y sub zero for, that's drawn from a binomial distribution. We use this as starting values, and then we iteratively generate uh, values for Y one observation at a time as a function of um, outcomes in all other observations. We do this until we simulate a complete um, network Y sub one. And then we iterate steps using Y sub one as starting values. We discard the first 100 of generated networks for burn-in and then we record every 50th network after that. Um, Monte Carlo um, analysis shows that our model is able to recover consistent estimates of beta sub zero, beta sub one, and the spatial dependence parameter eta. So the next step is to apply our model to empirical applications. We have two applications. The first application is um, international alliance formation. Here we want to test two competing hypotheses. The first hypothesis posits that alliances form as a result of ideational balancing. Consistent with this, we should observe alliance formation in different parts of the ideational space. If this process is taking place, then our coefficient on the dependence term should be positive. The competing hypothesis, of course, is that alliances cluster in ideational space. So the competing hypothesis is that we should observe alliances cluster in ideational space. Uh, if this is true, then this would be consistent with observing a negative coefficient on a dependence parameter. To test this, we use data on international alliances between 1946 and 2007. We treat each alliance as a network edge, um, and we specify the W matrix using ideational distance between alliances, as I previously showed. And then we have some statistical controls. Here are the results. The result that we're interested in is the coefficient on the ideational distance. We see it's positive and statistically significant, which is consistent with a complementarity process. So it's consistent with the ideational balancing hypothesis. When states that are a threat to a pair of states start forming alliances, then the given pair of states respond bonds by also forming an alliance to counterbalance the ideological threat. Um, in the second application, we'll look at co-sponsorships in US Senate. Here we have uh, very similar hypotheses. The first hypothesis is the ideological balancing hypothesis that tells that predicts that we should observe co-sponsorship clusters in the opposite parts of the ideational space. Again, this would be consistent with a positive coefficient on the dependence term. And um, the second hypothesis is um, posits ideational clustering and states that we should observe co-sponsorships cluster in ideational space. And this would be consistent with the negative coefficient on the dependence term. To test these, we use data on legislative co-sponsorships of labor-related legislation. So we decided that we're going to narrow um, a narrow focus to just one topic of legislation, and we chose labor. Uh, we're going to look at 
the Senate of the 107th U.S. Congress. We're going to treat all potential co-sponsorships as edges, and we're going to use DW nominate scores, the first dimension, to measure ideational distance in the connectivity matrix W. And then we're going to have some statistical controls. So here, um, here are the results. We see that the coefficient on the ideological distance here is actually negative and statistically significant, which uh, says that rather than polarizing, legislative co-sponsorships actually cluster. I'm going to take a guess and say they're probably clustering in the middle of the ideational space. So this is consistent with the second hypothesis that posits ideational clustering. Okay, so in conclusion, many political science applications to require reconceptualization of networks as dependencies among edges rather than nodes. Um, I showed how to model these types of processes theoretically and also statistically using a local structure graph model. A local structure graph model is a useful statistical tool that allows us to model a large number of processes that might be of interest in political science, such as alliance uh, formation, but also legislative co-sponsorships, parties joining to share ballot lines, multilateral cooperation, such as sanctions, diffusion, interest group behavior, and other types of processes. So this concludes my presentation. Now I'm ready for any questions. Okay. All right, uh, thank you, Olga, for that presentation. Uh, at this point, uh, Olga is available to take questions from the audience. Uh, you can ask a question using the Zoom Q&A button that appears at the bottom of your webinar window. And um, I have a question. So I was just going through the, um, the slide. This is uh, slide number, let's see, slide number 15 and 16. I was trying to figure out exactly um, uh, how this how this model is put together? So it seems like the the equation on on slide fifteen that's that's just a like that's just a logit, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> it's it's a, a very weirdly written logit. I, I took a second to figure that out, and yes. then uh, so on the next slide, uh, it looks like what's happening is that the um, the R, the sort of the index in the logit is a combination of sort of global level parameters and then yeah. local level parameters, right? So some things influence the, influence how much the, oh, there's how much connectivity there is in the network as a whole. And then some things in, influence how much your personal or your sort of local connectivity is. Is that, is that right? Well, uh, let's, let's see. So the first term here is just edges forming as a result of edge level covariates. So mm -hmm. if you think of alliances, this is alliances forming because two states are similar in terms of the distribution of power or two states are both democracies, right? So these are our very traditional, either, either state level covariates, right? Node level covariates mm -hmm. or uh, dyadic covariates here. Mm -hmm. And then the second term is how an alliance may or may not form in response to other alliances that may or may not form within the network. So mm -hmm. this terms allows us to capture whether the Soviet Union is more likely to form an alliance with, say, um, I don't know, Cuba, if uh, U.S. forms an alliance with um, West Germany, mm -hmm. right? So that's that's those types of processes are captured with this uh, with this local dependence term. So how how is this different from um, just writing down an ordinary logit model where you've got you know typical covariates? And then uh, to think about the, the possibility of balancing, you put in some covariate that talks about, for example, uh, the number of other alliances in the network, or maybe the number of alliances times their ideological um, average valence or something like that. In other words, how does this improve on um, just sort of trying to muck, muck it through with an ordinary logic? Because that's, I mean, that's what most of us would do, right? If we wanted to model this stuff, we wouldn't think of this. We would just say, well, you know, I just need to model these things as part of a, a logit or something. How does this improve on that? Uh, so you can, obviously you can do what you just said. Those would be, uh, I guess, sort of simpler ways to get at what I'm trying to get. Here we allow, um, we model edge formation as a function of 
not just all alliances that are formed that formed say in the previous time period in the network. So you can just count the alliances that formed in the previous time period, but all the alliances that can potentially form or not form, right? So we have this uh, basically a lagged, spatially lagged dependent variable. So mm -hmm. uh, we account for the probability of these alliances forming or not forming, and then that informs the formation of our alliance. So this is a more, I guess, sophisticated way to get at what you can also get at by using more blunt measures like the number of alliances. I was going to ask you, since you mentioned spatial autoregression, um, you know, there's been a lot of work I'm thinking of, like the paper by uh, uh, Beck and Kyle Beardsley, and there's a third person in there too, I think, yeah. about spatial autoregression models. And I've taught those in uh, in the past. I've taught those in some of my classes. How does your how does your model compare to like a, an SAR model? Okay, so I have a slide on that, actually. I'm going to flip through it real quick. Okay, so there are, um, if I were to compare them, there are several main points of comparison. The first point is that a SAR model, so a SAR model, the one that you're talking about by Beardsley et al., is, uh, has a continuous dependent variable. Here we have a binary dependent variable, and we're using the uh, exponential family in order to model this. So I guess a more, I think a more fitting comparison would be to compare this to spatial probit. Mm -hmm. Now spatial probit, so spatial probit then uses um, a probit function, and here we're using a exponent, a, a logit function in order to model this. Um, so if we were to compare this to spatial probit, um, there are two uh, main advantages that I see. The first advantage is the mathematical elegance. So spatial probit, if you read, for example, there's a paper by Cook and Francis uh, and Hayes, I think. If you um, read that paper, spatial probit um, does this additional step, right? It, it posits that there is this latent variable that then we observe or don't observe, right? This model does not posit any, any latent process. It directly models your dependent variable as binary. So to me, this is uh, an advantage because it adds mathematical elegance. A related advantage is that this model very easily extends to other types of dependent variables. So we're using the exponential family, so we can very easily incorporate count, uh, incorporate this to, for example, model count data or um, categorical outcomes with more than one category or ordinal outcomes. Whereas with the um, spatial probit, um, it's not as easily extendable. It's not as directly extendable to those. So there are two, uh, two uh, mathematical advantages, as I see it. And then also there are some other differences. So this model, unlike spatial autoregression or spatial probit, does not posit that, uh, does not uh, model these feedback loops where uh, the outcome in uh, um, I is, a, is affected by all I's neighbors, but I's neighbors are also affected by all of their, all their own neighbors and neighbors affect neighbors. And th there's a feedback loop that goes back and forth for a long time until um, it stabilizes and uh, we recover the coefficients. Here, we make an assumption that the loop stops at the first degree of dependence. So I is affected by I's neighbors, but I is not affected by the neighbors of, of its neighbors, right? So we end this feedback loop. And um, um, this brings some advantages in terms of uh, uh, minimizing bias in the model. So if you think about these feedback loops, if you introduce any amount of bias in the uh, measurement of uh, connectivity, then this bias is going to feed back, back and forth through all of these feedback loops and it's going to multiply. Whereas in this model, we, uh, we stop the feedbacks at immediate neighbors. So that should also help alleviate any problems with bias. I have some more questions, but I, I noticed there's a question from the audience, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to that question instead. Okay. Uh, uh, Chang Yu Kwok asked, thanks for the great presentation. It's very insightful. Uh, I have a question. What do you think of the power of the use of local connectivity to the use of edge covariates in conventional social network analysis? The power of local... So, um, okay. So... I'm asked, I'm not sure if I fully understand the question, but um, I'm sometimes asked how this compares to ergoms, right? To the um, 
exponential random graph models. And so my answer to this is that it compares very directly. And in fact, if you want, if you prefer ergoms, if you like ergoms, you can think of this. So this is my natural parameter function. You can think of this term here. So I call it local dependence term. But you can think of this as a specification of a Markovian feature that ergoms then would use to model some, some type of dependence. So if you want, you can think of these as a special case of ergoms, or you can go to even a broader level of abstraction and think of, of both these models and ergoms as a type of logit, right? Because we start with logit and then we add some spatial dependence, whether we call it an ergom or whether we call this uh, a um, local structure graph model. So that, that's my answer to that. You know, I'm thinking about um, you. You raised the the substantive question of ideological balancing versus ideological clustering mm -hmm. in alliances, and I I am no expert in alliances, but but what I would think is it would be in principle possible for both things to be happening. So in principle, you could be threatened by if you're NATO, you could be threatened by the Warsaw Pact, but you could also seek to, given that you're threatened by the Warsaw Pact, you could seek to recruit new members into NATO that are um, different than you for various strategic reasons. Mm -hmm. And I am curious because your model produced essentially one parameter, mm -hmm. right? And I'm curious as to if you think that those things, it's it's possible for them both to be happening. So in other words, you're threatened by this other alliance that has a lot of ideological coherence that's opposite to you, but at the same time, you're trying to can, can recruit members that are disparate from you or, or at least somewhat different from you. How would you capture that? Hmm. So this model is very flexible in the sense that it allows, it doesn't have to be just one uh, local dependence that we're modeling. We can modeling multiple types of, of local dependencies at the same time. So if I wanted to model whether I'm more likely to form an alliance in response to some ideational threat. And and also, um, so am I more likely to form an alliance because states that are far away from me are forming alliances? Or um, you can have an additional one that does, that captures whether I'm more likely to form an alliance if states that are far away from me are not forming alliances. So you can make it asymmetrical, you can do, you can test um, both types of processes forming and not forming alliances, or you can also specify different types of dependencies. So you can have multiple spatial dependence terms, one aimed at modeling um, who they may want to recruit into their, right, how, specify your matrix in terms of how much they may want to have a certain, certain state in an alliance, and then have a separate dependence parameter where the W matrix is uh, what it currently is, which is um, how much how much they're threatened. So you can try to be creative with these W terms, and you can include multiple terms to try to get a different process at the same time. So what do you think um, the the applications of this methodology are that are going to be most advantageous relative to the kind of empirical work that's already happening? In other words, where are the where are the real contributions that you see that this model is going to make relative to the sort of standard methodologies that we're already using? Well, it depends by what you mean by standard methodologies. So if you mean spatial models, how this is, um, what types of processes this model is more useful for compared to other types of spatial models, then I think, well, <laughs> I'm biased here, but I think that this model is actually, the assumptions behind this model are actually uh, more accurate in terms of reflecting what is happening compared to, say, spatial autoregression, right? So I think it's uh, um, much more defensible to make an assumption that U.S. and Canada, that U.S. Say, is affected by Canada, but is not affected by other neighbors of Canada through Canada, right? So this infinite, or not infinite, but this continuous feedback loops assumption, I think, is actually not as... Uh, easily to defend as um, uh, some spatial autoregression people make it sound. And I think that in a lot of processes, um, these loops do not go for a long time back and forth through neighbors, neighbors, but actually the influence stops at neighbors affecting you. So I think I think it's, it has a lot of potential for these types of applications and maybe more so than um, the models that we're more used to, which are spatial autoregression. All right. Well, it looks like uh, we're, we don't have any more questions. So I'm going to go ahead and, and thank Olga for being our presenter this week.
I want to point out uh, that this presentation uh, will be posted to our website shortly after the broadcast, so you can watch it again later or share it to somebody else who might be interested. Uh, I also want to announce uh, that next week, due to Thanksgiving in the United States, the IMC will be off. Uh, but you can tune in on Friday, December 1st at noon Eastern when we post a talk uh, from Pamela Ban from Harvard University. You can uh, see our website, www.methods-colloquium.com to get more information about this talk and the rest of the schedule of talks in the spring semester. Uh, thanks, Olga, for giving the presentation this week. Thank you. And I hope to see everyone uh, after Thanksgiving. <laughs>